I am Rihanna Paneras, a senior researcher at the Institute for Security Studies. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining me today to discuss this important topic. The purpose of this session is to identify the role of the police as a mechanism of governance and how international policing can be utilized to support peace efforts towards sustainable peace. As you know, the Institute for Security Studies is focused on supporting human security in Africa and international policing is one of the important focus areas in which the ISS is rendering support to the African Union. I want to talk to you about the current global situation on conflict and efforts to deal with it. The dynamics of and distinction between the military and police tasks. We will also look at the role of the police in society with a special reference to their role in peace operations and also the areas in which the African Union can effectively utilize the police. I will also make some recommendations towards future utilization of the police in all efforts towards peace and security on the African continent. Let's now have a look at the current situation. During the last two decades, we have seen an upsurge in intrastate conflict across the globe with intensified levels of violence. Simultaneously, there has been an emergence of extremism and transnational organized crime. In various areas, there has been high levels of tension, including regime change, Ma uh, weapons of mass destruction, territorial disputes, insurgency, terrorism, and organized crime. What did the world do about this situation? In order to deal with the conflict situations, there are currently 17 United Nations and AU peacekeeping operations, also called peace operations or peace support operations, in the world of which 10 are in Africa, as you can see on this map. Apart from these peacekeeping missions, the UN also simultaneously has 18 special political missions in conflict or post-conflict countries and other areas where there are high levels of political tension. Of these, as you can see in the red, eight are in Africa. The African Union further have various missions all over Africa to deal with peacemaking, post-conflict reconstruction and development. I want you to just think about the situation and the current efforts that are in place to deal with it. The following questions then arise. Why do we not achieve sustainable peace? Why is the situation not improving? Why are more people dying, raped and displaced? Are the current approaches that are heavily dependent on military deployments sufficient or do we need more emphasis on alternative approaches? Let's take a closer look at the circumstances in the affected countries. In all these conflict situations, one will find a deterioration of rule of law and limited or a lack of access to justice that are either a contributing factor to and or a result of the conflict. The weakening of state institutions, such as the police, inhibit the state's ability to protect its citizens. The civilian populations feel that they are not protected and they start to look for alternatives. This creates a breeding ground and opportunity for extremist groups and criminal networks to exploit the situation and to portray themselves as patrons or protectors of the community. The absence of an effective police further provides for impunity and creates opportunities for criminal activities. Let me take you back to Somalia. Somalia has been in constant conflict since 1991 and various international interventions were executed. 
However, even though missions were deployed, even most Rwandans were displaced. It reached a point when an international community withdrew its military forces in 1995. When the AU mission in Somalia was deployed in 2007, the initial mandate was to build the capacity of the host state. Listen again, it was to build the capacity of the host state. However, at that stage only military forces were deployed and it was only two years later that police were deployed to the mission while civilians followed even later. When military gains were made, there was no capability to support the government of Somalia to establish the necessary security institutions and justice systems. Let's now have a look at Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab was the youth wing of the Union of Islamic Courts and it emerged as an independent group in 2006. Al-Shabaab indeed means the youth and it has been successful in recruiting young people. It is against the federal government of Somalia and considers anybody that supports the government, including Amazon, as its enemy. The lack of a coordinated peace building process in areas liberated by the coalition forces and the absence of state institutions and services gave Al-Shabaab an opportunity to have strong local support since 2010. In some areas, Al-Shabaab is the only provider of public and social services. Although we might see them as an extremist group, the communities view them as a social group that takes care of their needs. The communities therefore pledge their allegiance and support to Al-Shabaab. As the Somali government is too weak to enact law and order in the entire country, there is a multi-million dollar illegal trade on major items such as charcoal, sugar and agricultural products. This trade provides forces like Al-Shabaab with an income to finance their operations. Even an increase in military forces could not stop the situation. What could then be the solution to this? Let us have a look at the differences between the military and the police. You might ask, why can the military not perform all the duties that are needed for a peace support operation? What can the police bring to the table that the military cannot? It is often found that people have a misconception about the role of the police and the military and that there is not a clear understanding on their different roles. I can understand how this can be the case as both the military and the police are in uniform, have a ranking system, carry firearms and use some levels of force in certain circumstances. However, the main goals and objectives of the military are to protect the state, normally from external threats and attacks. It may also be utilized to deal with threats against the state that are internal of nature and where more force is needed. Their doctrine is aimed at offensive warfare and defensive protection of the state and its people. Their training is then also aligned with these objectives and is mainly aimed at requiring the hard skills for these activities while the approaches to information gathering and analysis is aimed at identifying threats against the state at large. In peace operations, the task of the military include protection of mission personnel and humanitarian actors, monitoring of ceasefires, keeping conflicting parties apart, and physical protection of civilians who might be threatened or under attack. The police, on the other hand, is an integral part of a country's governance architecture. 
with the main aim of protecting civilians from crime and harm. Police officers are the first point of contact in the process to gain access to justice. The police further has the primary responsibility to deal with terrorism as well as organized and transnational crime. Although police officers are trained to handle firearms, their training is more focused on legal knowledge and soft skills to effectively interact and build relations with the community in handling conflict and dealing with crime. Although they also play a role in security aspects against the state, their main focus is to render a protection service to the population. Their approach to information gathering and analysis is therefore also focused on crime and threats against the communities they serve. There's an again, it's communities they serve. The next part is a little complicated, but it is really important to understand the concept. The manner in which the rule of law is applied has a direct bearing on the overall governance system. I'm going to repeat this. The manner in which the rule of law is applied has a direct bearing on the overall governance system. Let me explain where the police fit into the governance architecture based on this diagram. You can look at the little arrows which actually shows that the government is rendering services to the community and have to protect the community. The level of fairness and equality in services rendered by the state impact on the satisfaction level of the population in general and the level of stability in the country. The police in the yellow circle form part of the security sector that has to render services towards ensuring the availability of equal access to justice and the rule of law. If any of these services are perceived not to be effective, it will have a negative impact on the overall governance system and the level of satisfaction of the population. As already indicated earlier, weakening state institutions and the deterioration of rule of law contribute to resistance from the population and the search for alternatives. You might ask, if the police is then more focused on serving their local populations, what is then their role in the international arena? Let me explain it as follows. In all peace efforts, there is an element of peace building, as shown by the dark blue arrow. And as part of that, we have conflict prevention, peacemaking, peacekeeping, early recovery and post-conflict reconstruction and development. These approaches do not always follow a specific sequence, but are interchangeable and can also be implemented simultaneously, depending on the situation. During the peacekeeping process, the police, based on their unique skill sets to interact with the community, make valuable contributions in the physical protection of civilians. While the four police units are armed, they specialize in public order and crowd management and have the ability to deal with smaller conflict situations in a less lethal manner than the military. Further to this, the individual police officers support the establishment of community policing initiatives that include community forums and the involvement of community members in crime prevention and response as well as victim support. They also assist in bridging the gap between the communities and the host state police through community education and trust building. <clears throat> this interaction further contributes positively to information gathering, 
analysis and early warning, as well as monitoring of incidents and the follow-up of cases. Let me give you another example. In UNIMED, the mission in Darfur, it was found that due to a lack of trust, there was no collaboration between some of the local communities and the Sudan police. Through interventions, the UNIMED police succeeded to establish the relevant mechanisms and facilitate collaboration between communities and the local police. Examples thereof was in Hasahisa and Hamadaya camps at Zalinji, where the communities initially did not even want their police to enter the camps. The same was done in Forabaranga, Al Janina, El Salam at Nyala, Zamzam at El Fasher, El Dain, and various other areas. And you can see these areas on the map. In bridging the gap, the communities also became more willing to participate in the internal dialogue as part of the peacemaking process. While interaction with the community is essential, the actual aim of the mission should be to leave behind a situation where peace is sustainable. This requires a strengthened state that is able to deal with its own protection of civilian processes, render effective services and have effective rule of law mechanisms in place. The police deployed in peace operations therefore have the role to build the capacity of the host state police towards democratic policing, taking into consideration international human rights law principles. This is done through strategic, administrative and operational support, as well as training, mentoring and advice. This can only be done by individuals who are experienced police officers with the relevant skill sets. These activities can form part of peacekeeping and early recovery, as well as post-conflict reconstruction and development processes. By building effective and democratic police and other security institutions, a recurrence of conflict can also be prevented. The police can further be utilized in areas where there are signs of emerging threats and conflict. They can monitor the situation and interact with the local police and communities at an early stage to identify some contributing factors and root causes. The necessary guidance and capacity building can then be provided to prevent the situation from moving towards fully-fledged conflict. Elections in countries are normally secured under the supervision of the police. However, when we look at the situation in Burundi, the AU deployed military and civilian monitors, but not the police. The military observers were expected to interact with the local police and other rule of law institutions while their expertise are not in this field. In this situation, deploying police alongside or instead of the military could have had a different impact. It is further interesting that the UN opted to have police monitors. Taking into consideration the current increasing conflict situations globally and, on the other hand, indications that countries such as the USA want to decrease its contribution to peace operations, it will be necessary to look at alternative approaches to deal with these situations. As most of the current initiatives are in Africa, it can further be expected that Africa will be affected the most. The African Union will therefore have to be creative in optimizing all possible resources and alternative approaches to deal with the security situation on the continent. Before I make my recommendations, we need to have a closer look at the cross-cutting areas 
in which the African Union can utilize the police as an instrument towards governance, peace and security. Within the framework of the African peace and security architecture and related divisions, the police can play an important role and render advice and support on peace support, peace building, post-conflict reconstruction and development, early warning and the African standby force. On the governance side and within the African governance architecture, the police can play an essential role in the areas of constitutionalism and rule of law, human rights and transitional justice, as well as governance and public service delivery. It is, however, unfortunate that in all these areas there still is a heavy dependence on military advisors, while within the whole AU system there are only two police officers within the Peace Support Division. I am not saying that the police should replace the military, but I am of the opinion that the world and specifically the African Union can benefit from fully taking cognizance of and utilizing the contribution the police can make to peace and security on the continent. Taking into consideration all that was said thus far, I want to make the following seven key recommendations. The African Union should take action on the following aspects. Promotion of common understanding of policing and its benefits. They should take cue from lessons learned internationally from reports as well as previous missions where police was used successfully. They should fully integrate policing into all AU policies, strategies and decision-making processes towards good governance, peace and security. There shall be, should be a review of doctrines and policy documents related to peace, security and governance, including the ASF doctrine. They should enhance and strengthen the police capacity of the African Union Commission and employ a chief police advisor. They should also involve police experts from the initial stages in all analytical planning and deployment processes. They should advocate this message to Member States for commitment and support. I want to conclude. If the African Union is serious in its efforts to silence the guns and to achieve the objectives set out in Africa Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. It will be necessary to consider peace interventions that goes beyond military intervention. It is necessary to follow a balanced, multidisciplinary approach and should include the effective and optimal utilization of the advantage the police bring to the table.